I was mortified to find out the other day that the class 43 HST units from Hornby are now retailing at an astonishing £362.99p. There are some upgrades in there, but it's a staggering price to pay. But if you can get your hands on an earlier version, let's see what we can do to bring it up to date. Hi, welcome to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And this is the first of two videos where I upgrade the older Hornby 125 HST units. In this video, we'll look at, look at changing the motor and in the second one, converting it from DC to DCC. Now this tale actually starts a few weeks ago when one of my patrons by the name of Steve asked me if it's actually worth converting an old uh, Hornby HST unit from DC to DCC and glibly I, t I turned back and said not really just go and buy yourself a new one. What an awful thing to say and I apologised to him and said I tell you what Steve send it to me and I'll have a go and as quick as a flash this little unit here appeared on my doorstep. Now this is Steve's model. It's a Hornby R332 and was produced sometime between 1980 and 1984. So it's round about 40 years old. It has a little bit of sort of what we say it's not play worn, but you know, it's starting to show its age. But as a model goes, you know, this is 40 year old, you can't complain about this. Now, obviously, time's moved on, and here's my version, which is an R2701. It's factory fitted with an eight pin decoder, so it's DCC ready, um, produced between 2008 and 2010. Both are the original sort of models. Uh, on the 1976 1978 version because they don't have the exhaust baffle. Clearly there's nothing we can do cosmetically to bring this up to this standard. It is what it is. But let's have a little look at how it performs um, and see what we can do to the guts of the model. Now I've connected Steve's uh, 125 unit up to an old duet of mine on a rolling road and if I turn the power up you can see we're well up um, nearly half before she bursts into life and as you can see if I turn it right up you can see the she has white lights um, on the front which is a nice little feature and hopefully you can hear through my microphone the tone of this motor if I turn it in reverse, it seems to run slightly faster in reverse. And there's obviously quite a lot of shuddering going on here. And there are no red lights, um, so obviously it doesn't have reverse, uh, reverse lights. OK, let's whip it onto a piece of track and see how it performs. OK, we've replaced the rolling road with a piece of track. So if I turn up the power now, and then she shall burst into life. We're a third of the way through. Oh, bit of movement there. Approaching halfway now. And off she goes. Bring her back the other way. We're past halfway now. Oh, there she goes. So it's a little bit jerky, let's say. So let's see how slow we can get it to run forwards. It's actually not too bad at all, is it? And then in reverse. Still nothing. Oh, there she goes. <laughs> reverse is a little uh, unpredictable, let's say. So now it's time to get her on the bench and see what we can do. Well, here we are on the bench with this little 125 unit. And obviously the first thing we need to do is take off the body shell. Now it's held on by five little um, clips, one, two, three and four the other side and also one hidden away on the back end which is a little bit of a tinker let's say. So what I have is 
some business cards and what I tend to do with these is to try to poke them in and tease out the um, clips and therefore the clips get pushed out and hopefully stay out so that's one hopefully yep and these things always always take some time so the best thing to do let's say is is take your time because it's uh you don't really want to do any damage at this stage of the game Right, okay, there's the back end out and the front end must come out last, which, uh, there we go, oh, ghastly, and there we have it. So what have we got? Well, there's a ring field motor, as you would expect. Um, there's some weights here that someone has added, or, well, they've probably added, and um, then the, the, turning to the front end you can see a filament bulb which is obviously used to give you the two white lights when it's running ahead. And there's also a diode here, breaking news, and there's also a diode just here um, which stops the lights, the, the white light from lighting when the engine is running in reverse because obviously no, normally you'd have two reds and this one hasn't got any reds so you have that diode there. So what do we do now? Well, we need to remove the uh, the engine component, the, sorry, the engine, the motor components, and strip it down. So this is where it gets interesting. Now I must confess that um, before embarking on this evolution, I went to numerous YouTube channels who have done this and seen the way they're sort of their methodology and how they recommend doing the job. Um, but one uh, YouTuber stood head and shoulders above the others and that's a chap called Mark from Horns and Whistles Workshop and I gave Mark a ring. Um, we chatted about you know what he uses and so on and so forth and down in the show more tab there will be a link to both his YouTube channel and more cunningly his eBay page where he sells these components because what he what he's done is he's made um, a 3D printed sleeve that goes on the outside of this little motor and I think it's rather fascinating the way it works. Also supplied from Mark are these few bits and bobs here which is um, a small plastic washer, uh, an insulated washer to stop this shorting out on the case of the um, motor. Three circlips or as he calls them on his video, E-clips. Anyway, three circlips. You only need uh, two, but he's a decent sort of bloke. He's thrown an extra one in because they are so small and they can go zinging off across your room. And a gear wheel. And finally, a little piece of hink shri hink sh heat shrink tubing, which is quite interesting, really, because when I use heat shrink tubing, you never know what sort of size to buy. And in the end, um, in my... Amazon page down below I bought myself a complete set of various sizes of heat shrink tubing because you never seem to have the right size. Anyway, so you get this kit for an astounding £15 the last time I looked. I did warn Mark that he might get a little bit of a rush on these uh, kits um, should people enjoy this video. So what we need to do now is to obviously is to replace this ring field motor with these bits and bobs um, so the first thing we need to do now is to remove this motor and strip out the wiring. Now it is worth mentioning at this stage that if this is the front of the loco then it's the left hand set of wheels at the front and the right hand set of wheels at the back that provide the power. If I just turn this over, so these wheels feed the, let's say, the negative side of the power and these the positive. And here are your insulated um, uh, track, traction tires. So that's how it works. These gears on, on these wheels do do nothing at all. They are just 
electrical pickups. That's all they are, pickups on this side and pickups on this side. You can see on here that um, Steve has actually fitted um, DCC Concepts power base in order to get up his helix, hence he's fitted magnets to these and quite strong they are too. Right, so let's pull out these cables and get it apart. Now I just use an ordinary pair of um, snipe nose pliers and these are little spade connectors here so these should pull off quite easily. If you're unsure of what you're doing and you've never done this sort of thing before, get your mobile phone out and simply take photographs as you go because if you get a bit of a pickle and you get kind of lost, you'll know where you got the cables from. So the diode was clipped onto the body shell down there. There was the feed that went to the front left. And then around the back end here, hopefully you can see, there's another little spade connector in there, which goes onto this contact here. So I shall pull that one off there, hopefully. Should pull off quite easily, really. Don't want to break it off. And there's also a spade that it goes to, I believe, down here on the body shell. So it's hard to see it without blocking the camera's view. All twisted back. Right, that makes it a little bit easier to see and then hopefully you can see then I'll pull that off. Beautiful. Okay, so let's get rid of the body shell itself and here there is a small spring, sort of, well not spring-loaded catch, there's no spring, but it's a case of pushing it down and then the, the body should simply just drop through. Okay, so there goes the chassis, let's get that out of the way and that bit of wire. And then we're just left with this item here. Beautiful. Behind these sort of springs here are where the, um, the uh, carbon brushes go, which power this, um, I think this is a three pole motor. Um, all kind of straightforward really. But now we need to strip out the plastic area from here. And I believe we sort of prize this out again, don't we? Let's have a little look. So with a small flathead screwdriver, what I'm going to do is it's on the the end that's not on the coupling is push it down there. And I think it's a case of just prising this back and it should just, oh, there we go. It should just slot out and there's our little cradle with um, his magnets. Oh, they're kind of, whoops, I'm afraid your magnets came off there. Fella, you have to glue those back on. <clears throat> which just leaves us now with our dinky little motor. Next we need to remove the wheels to get the uh, motor retaining plate off. But because we need to remove um, the wheels, I'm thinking we're going to put a bit of extra force on here. So what I'm going to do first is just remove these gears. And that should be straightforward. If I just prise off this little brass plate. Oh, there she goes. And take that out of the way. Um, it's worth remembering which side this goes on. Um, so if you can see that little edge, it points out to out of the motor. Anyway, so we need that one off. Um, then the gears come out and we just lift these off. And obviously before we reinstall those, they'll have a little clean. And then these two gear wheels And now we want to um, prise off or, or pull off these wheels. So hopefully I can do it with sort of th thumb and forefinger and just pull them apart. I don't really want to use tools. So I'm just, if you can see what I'm doing, just gripping there. Nope. Let's try again. Oh, nope, that one won't come. Oh, blimey, that hurts. Let's try this one. No, we need to prise them off. 
Um, and of course, the problem with prizing is you could possibly bend the uh, the shaft itself. So what I shall do is try to prise them off both sides at the same time, if that makes sense. So if I just twist these screwdrivers now, hopefully you're putting the same amount of force on both sides. And I did feel them go, but not quite. So if I do that again, just pop those two screwdrivers in there, give them a twist. And it's almost off now. A little bit more pressure. Ah, there we go. So, there's one wheel. Obviously it's not, not difficult to, to remember which was on which side here because obviously the gear's on the gear side. So we should take the two axles out. I'm not too sure if that piece stays in. There's a little yeah, that stays where it is. And now all I need to do is repeat the same on the other side. There we go. All right, park these out of the way. And now we can re remove this, this um, retaining plate. This is what it was all about because these wheels, um, these, these axles were sitting in front of this piece here um, and to remove this retaining plate, there are a couple of catches. And if you can see here, there's a small catch and there's a corresponding one on the other side. Where is it? There. And then there are two deep, buried in the deeps, in, in the depths of in there. So if I can show you the easy ones to, to unclip, which is that one there and that one there. Can't see it now. It's already unclipped. And then I need to go into this area down here, which I'm sorry, it is just so difficult to show you in this light. But there are another two little corresponding clips in there to be depressed. Can't see it myself. So now you can see I can pull this plate out, which I couldn't do before. And then there is the armature. And as I mentioned, um, this is a, a three pole motor because you can see the three segments. That's how it all works. So what have opened and then in here you'll find there's obviously the carbon brushes and the springs that um, hold the whole thing together and you know that sort of thing you want to keep an eye on this because if you ever want to use this motor again or to make the meaning this process obviously is reversible you want to try and keep hold of these bits now the next thing we need to do is to remove the armature and the permanent magnet i think that sits around here so how are we going to get that out well we need to punch out that center pin freeing up that gear and hopefully this should all drop out so how are we going to do that? Well, I have a two millimeter punch and this is the only specialist thing that I have actually bought um, for this job. And I've probably bought the wrong one because you can get some of these punches with a tiny dimple in the end. And that might have been a better option. This has just got a flat end. So I just need to be a little bit more cautious. Now, when I'm punching that out, of course, I've got to make sure I'm not damaging the rest of this. And there are these two plastic pins here. Are they plastic or metal? These things. They might be metal actually. Um, but I don't want to damage any of that so I need to brace it. So what I thought I would do is with these two rather oversized pieces of timber is if I place it there and then I can punch that with a small hammer and hopefully That'll work. Who knows? As it's standing proud, I'm going to use a, an old motorcycle valve. 
to start it off. Right, now I switch to the You can see it's coming loose already and it's starting to come out. So I switch to the 2 mil punch and hopefully there's my gear wheel and there's my armature. All quite straightforward really, wasn't it? And there comes the permanent magnet. Right, let's put all these pieces to one side, you never know, we couldn't use them in the future. And carry on. So now it's time for reassembly. Now the first thing to do is to pop that little plastic washer on top of the motor drive to stop the motor housing shorting out with this metal case. And then you just insert the motor. So the drive shaft pops through the hole. And then these two um, lugs come through those, those holes and we turn it over. And as you can see, hopefully there's the drive shaft coming through. And then those two lugs there that came through need the circlips to be fitted. Obviously the, t the, sorry, the cables, I may have mentioned it, the cables come through the top. Right, so now we need to fit these dinky little circlips. So hopefully we can just pop those into place. And Mark's taken the uh, precaution of putting three in each pack in case they go winging off, which, um, let's face it, circlips have a habit of doing that. It's hard for me to fit these with it with enabling you to see it at the same time. So I kind of need to hold it still. Let's try a pair of pliers. I think it's getting there. Yes. Popped it on. About eighth time lucky. Then of course we need just to put some downward pressure on it to make sure it grips. Make sure it's as far down as you can go and then move on to the second one. Yeah, much easier with pliers. Push it into place. I think it's easier to put a bit of downward force on it with these snipe nose pliers. Then hopefully the motor should be in nice and firmly and those clips will naturally hold it in place. Lovely. Right. So that's our motor in place and hopefully, yeah, that spins nicely. So what's next? Well, we could put those wheels in next, I think. And the wheels must go on the side of the gears. So that must go through from this side. And the gear wheel on the other side. I've cleaned all these components up with IPA, by the way, um, to degrease them. And I shall use my back-to-back -back gauge to make sure these are correct as soon as I find it. So I pop the other wheel on. Oops, wrong way around. <laughs> pop the other wheel on. Little pinch again. Lovely. I think that one's gone in a little bit too far actually. I could just feel the axle coming through. Yep, anyway, they spin fine. Right, what's next? Well, we have this little um, uh, gear, gear, well, cog, I suppose, isn't it? 
and that pushes onto the sh nat oops that naturally pushes onto the shaft a little bit of pressure on there and it should be a nice tight fit and indeed it is a little bit further to go super job so now it must be the turn of the cogs and if you remember we had four cogs we had like those weren't they so these ones went on first like so then these ones went on this is where I get to the point of finally forgetting something isn't it so that should turn and all the wheels turn and then finally if you remember that clip and this thing sort of turned in an outward manner so that goes down to there and then that sort of pushes up into place like so and now hopefully when I turn this everything turns beautifully okay and we'll just remove that other piece that spare circlet right so that's the majority of the reassembly done that I can think of um, oil people always need to oil these things I use this um, label 108 from um, Golden Valley's Hobbies is my current oil of choice it's uh, certainly better than the stuff I used to use and it's just a case really of oiling the pivot points and we're not overloading this with oil by any stretch of the imagination just that we just need to uh, add it in there so it uh, turns nicely obviously we can oil from the bottom there on those um, exposed cogs of the wheels and they will eventually go back into the system but as we've cleaned it all off it was dry as a bone so a drop of oil won't do any harm there right and nothing too thick so that's my oil done right <laughs> where do we go from here and so to the reassembly now we've got uh, we first got to get the um, motor assembly back into its little cradle how do we do that well <coughs> excuse me there's a small hole here and a larger hole here and on this uh, the bogey assembly the motor assembly there's a small lug there and a larger lug there so it must go in that way around and then with a little bit of effort it should click into place there we are easy and then we move on to putting it back into the motor housing itself but before I do that I just want to put on this little cable because it might be a little bit more challenging when it's in place and it goes in here onto that little lug okay right so now we need to thread those three through the hole and this lines up with a little lug at the front and then like a spring loaded sort of bit of plastic at the back which just clicks into place like that and there we are all, all back together um, what's next well we've got a couple of cables there's this diode wire that clips onto another little lump that sticks out of this casing and then we're into the feeds to the motor now remember that this set of wheels feeds uh, is connected to the metal boss and the metal boss has this wire and then the set of wheels on this side are connected to this cable so we need to um, put these two these cables together and it should work but there's a little snag with that and that is we need to make sure that they're connected so that when the um, loco runs forwards the diode uh, the um, the headlights come on so to do that we need the rolling road right
Here's one I made earlier. So we pop it on the rolling road. Try and get these lined up. It's always a challenge. And that should be us all set. Okay. It's going forwards and the light's on. Right. So it's red to black and black to brown. That's a challenge, wouldn't it? So now we have a straightforward piece of soldering to do. Now, if I need to, um, I'm not going to cut these wires that short. I might need these longer at a later date. So I'm just going to strip a bit more of these, this uh, insulation off the black. If you remember, we're going black to brown. <clears throat> and I like these spade connectors. They can be very useful. So I'm going to keep a sort of an inch of that flex there in case I need that for another job. And then all I do with these is get off some of the insulation. And then before we put them together and solder them, um, Mark has included some heat shrink tubing. Now, heat shrink tubing is a funny old thing, really, because whenever I seem to want it, it's the wrong size. So what I have invested in, and I've got some here, is in my Amazon page down below, you'll find a link to this heat shrink tubing box. And if you can see inside, there are loads and loads of different sizes of heat shrink tubing. It might be easier to see in this camera, um, but yeah, there are loads of them um, because I always find that I sort of buy the, the uh, buy a certain length of it and it's the wrong diameter or whatever. Anyway, that's all two to one shrink ratio. Right, more to the point. Let's get back to to marks. So we need uh, a small amount of shrink, heat shrink to go over that uh, cable there. So this is the thing you forget to do: is to thread the heat shrink tubing over the cable before you solder it. And I'm sure there are people watching this thinking, yeah, I've done that before. You get there and you solder it all up, you put them together and then you forget. Right. So on the cables that we've stripped back, we just uh, twist them together. And then with a faithful old soldering iron that's sitting in the, in the side here, I'm just going to solder these cables together. like so, and then flatten it off and then slide the heat shrink over the top. And then I use the soldering iron then as the source of heat on the heat shrink. I know some people use um, hair dryers and lighters and all sorts of stuff. I tend to just use the soldering iron itself without putting too much heat into it, because the last thing you want to do is obviously melt the solder underneath. Got a bit of solder on there now, aren't I? Let's scrape that off. A bit more heat on that end. And there's one done, and then the second one is to there. And this is a solid core cable. I could feel that as soon as I went to snip through. Oops, did it again, didn't we? Forgot the heat shrink. Easy done. And then twist those two together. In with 
the solder. Looks good. Little heat shrink over the top. the heat once more See if we can do it from here avoid all the solder spilling onto the joint and then hopefully we're good to go and we can now take the chassis up and pop it on some rails and test it in anger Wish me luck. Now I've added a couple of bits of tape just to tidy it up and all we want to do now is a little uh, is a little trial and so bringing the power up slowly and there it goes a nice steady crawl. Obviously the headlight doesn't really come on because of the slow running speed you can just see it glowing and then if I bring it to a stop and then reverse it and once more a nice steady crawl, far better than with that ring field motor. Of course it's not all about slow speed invariably, so if I just send it off a bit more speed in it and you can see the light on the front illuminate and bring it back, same kind of speed, lovely. And that's a scale speed of round about 70 miles an hour. which I think is just fine. Right, stick a cover on it. There we go. But please be aware that I've yet to test the new motor's pulling power. Well, there we have it. Quite an interesting evolution, really, trying to breathe new life into one of these lovely old locos, 40 years old, blimey. And that's clearly older than a lot of the people who watch this channel. There we are. But if you spend, I don't know, 20 pounds, let's say, on a new motor and the, and the rest of it, or perhaps um, visit Mark's eBay page by the motor or his YouTube channel um, or, or both, um, you can always, if you don't have the confidence to do it yourself, you can always um, ask him to do it to one of your locos, your old, you know, Hornby 47 or whatever. You know, it's not just um, class 43 HST units, but it's the shock really of the Hornby new pricing scheme. And I think I said it was £365.99 for one of their new HSTs. And I'm sure it's lovely. Um, they're going to have 21 pin sockets and more lighting features and all the rest of it to deplete us of our money. It's the thing is, you know, should we be putting pounds and pounds and pounds into these companies rather than being a little more satisfied with the stock we've got and perhaps modifying the stuff that's getting a little bit old rather than hoofing it out? People have said to me, you know, Charlie, it's not all about DCC. What are the DCC guy, uh, the DC guys? So hopefully, I brought something. Um, to that avenue today. So I said all about Mark and his YouTube channel and his eBay page, but of course today is uh, one about one of my patrons, really, wasn't it? Steve, who sent me this model for me to have a little look at. Steve, I haven't broken it yet. <laughs> Rest assured, we were close. Um, next time I'm going to convert this from DC to DCC, and there's something for everyone in that one. Um, if you're a DCC modeler, I suppose. And of course, let's put up a, a decent set of lights. So we've got white lights running forward and red lights running rear. And of course, the lights are on when the, the loco is stationary. So that should bring um, a bit more interest to it. There we are. So that sums this one up. 
As per usual, I'd like to thank the people that help with the channel, and that's primarily my patrons, and there's the button, though people do uh, donate through PayPal. Don't forget to visit the old um, Amazon page, again listed in the Show More tab. There's the subscribe button, and there should be a video here and here. See you in two weeks, guys. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.